Welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast, where we are focused on bringing you information to help prevent from developing and improve from suffering with brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a physician and chief scientific wellness officer at Kemper Cognitive Wellness, and I'll be your guide on these sound waves. So whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have a loved one with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's, dementia, and just generally things in life's second half. If you have questions or comments, check us out on social media. To support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show if you find these episodes valuable. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. I have a really interesting guest that I've been excited to speak to now for a while since he agreed to be on the show. Our guest is Dr. Adam Woods. He is a cognitive neuroscientist with expertise in non-invasive brain stimulation, neuromodulation, and neuroimaging. He's a national leader in the field of transcranial electrical stimulation, leading the largest transcranial electrical stimulation trial in history, publishing the first comprehensive textbook in the field and led multiple field standard papers. He has all sorts of leadership roles at the Center for Cognitive Aging and Memory at McKnight Brain Institute at the University of Florida. Welcome to the show, Dr. Woods. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Absolutely. So how do you explain what it is that you do? I mean, the term neuromodulation and non-invasive brain stimulation, those are mouthfuls. And I think a lot of people don't really have any idea what we're even talking about. Can you... um, you just give us sort of a, a primer, a brief introduction of what those terms even mean? Sure. I think that's a great question. You know, very often people confound neuromodulation and neurostimulation. Neuromodulation is, is really a broad term. It means anything that alters or manipulates the, the function of the brain. And so that could be things like non-invasive brain stimulation, but that could also be things as simple as thought or behavioral interventions or training, but really as simple as I had a thought, I considered this information, and guess what? In your brain, things are changing. The function, the response of the neurons, the connections are firing in different ways that, that allow that thought. But when we use the term neuromodulation, relative to interventions or attempting to improve the human condition, what we're really talking about is using a variety of techniques and trying to harness their ability to manipulate or alter brain function, but in a positive direction, in a direction that might have a clinical impact or an impact on people. Whereas brain stimulation or non-invasive brain stimulation, which is the area that I work in, this really refers to a class of techniques that are meant to directly impact the brain, but do so through non-invasive approaches. So very often we do work in the electrical non-invasive brain stimulation, and that involves things like placing electrodes on the scalp and passing current through those electrodes. And that current penetrates the head, and then stimulates the underlying brain tissue to modulate that neural activity. Hmm. So you're introducing electricity to the brain, as it were. That's right. That's right. Is that safe? Yeah, you know, it is. It's one of those those things where we're really, when you one time someone says, ah, electrical current, you're delivering electrical current to the brain, they very often think immediately of electroconvulsive therapy. ECT, you go to the movies, right? The, 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 the psychiatric ward, yeah. That's right, right. So one flew over the cuckoo's nest or any other number of movie references. And that is passing electrical current into the brain uh, through electrodes placed on the scalp. But it's passing a massive amount of current through the brain with the goal of generating seizures. What we do and what we think of in terms of transcranial electrical stimulation And all the varieties of of types of methods that might represent, like direct current or alternating current or what have you, are using much, much smaller electrical currents. And so on the order of 10,000 volts, you might think of ECT or electroconvulsive therapy. Whereas, for, for example, 
transcranial direct current stimulation, this weak electrical current stimulation, we're talking about on the order of 20 volts, so much, much smaller. And it turns out that over 40,000 stimulation sessions using uh, transcranial electrical stimulation of this weak variety have been done around the world and have in fact been demonstrated to be safe in that no serious adverse events. So no one died from that, no seizures were caused, or a variety of other significant consequences that can come about when doing interventions of a variety of types. So this is a uh, good news. Somebody's studying it, studying it rigorously, looking for the bad stuff and not finding it too much. So would the umbrella term be transcranial electrical stimulation then? Or the non-invasive brain stimulations? Yeah, so there, I think there are their relative umbrella terms. Non-invasive brain stimulation is a really broad term that could involve electrical or magnetic-based or a variety of other approaches to brain stimulation, uh, but all in the non-invasive sense of not placing anything in the head or through the scalp or what have you. Whereas transcranial electrical stimulation is a slightly smaller umbrella term that refers to just those techniques applying electrical current to the head. Okay, can you can we go through some of those type of things? The, is that the transcranial alternating? Sure. Just if we could lay some of those out. Sure, I think that'd be great. Um, so transcranial direct current stimulation is a technique that involves passing a weak direct electrical current through electrodes. So in the wall, you have what's called typically alternating current, right? The current is flipping back and forth between those two prongs or more um, that are, are you would place into the wall. That is called alternating current. So there's a form of stimulation called transcranial alternating current stimulation, or TACS, and that really aims to oscillate that current at a given frequency. It might be something where you're attempting to oscillate that current to match inherent brain frequencies like alpha or theta or what have you. But in contrast, direct current means you're turning the current on and it's staying at a constant level for the entire duration of stimulation, right? The current passes through one electrode to another electrode. No change in that or alternation in that whatsoever. These two techniques are used in very similar ways, but their applications uh, and mechanisms vary quite a bit. One is really targeting altering the neuroplastic response of tissue. And neuroplasticity you can think of as learning at the neural level. Which one is that? So that would be direct current stimulation. So TDCS or transcranial direct current stimulation is really typically looking at modulating the neuroplastic response of the stimulated tissue, either making it a little more likely to fire or a little less likely to fire, depending on the stimulation parameters that are used. In contrast, alternating current really aims to, as I mentioned, interface or synchronize or desynchronize inherent frequencies that you might find within the brain naturally, like theta rhythms, for example, which are very important for working memory. Um, we have a study, in fact, right now that is looking at if we record a person's theta rhythm from frontal and parietal areas, um, which is, very, as I mentioned, very important for working memory, we're evaluating what happens when we feed that theta rhythm, their very own theta rhythm, back to them in sync with the inherent rhythm in their brain versus in what's called antiphase or in the opposite orientation to evaluate whether we can enhance working memory by further synchronizing theta or, or you know, briefly decrease working memory capacity by interfering with the frequency of that inherent rhythm. There are other electrical techniques that use other approaches to electrical current. One is called transcranial random noise stimulation, which actually bursts of random electrical noise through the electrodes and attempt to interface with these neural mechanisms in different fashions than the other two. And then a final version, which is quite a bit newer in terms of its investigation in, in humans, is transcranial pulsed current stimulation. All of them are using electrical current. They're just using the current in a slightly different waveform or fashion. So if we could take this out of the abstract for a second, so you're obviously a cognitive expert, can you give us an example of how people might be benefiting from these, what we've seen so far? So, I mean, by and large, these are currently research techniques, uh, especially in the cognitive space. There have been a wide variety of studies over the last 20 years that have attempted to look at how we can interface with different brain systems 
by stimulating them non-invasively to enhance or alter behavior. One example would be working memory function. It's probably one of the better studied areas of cognition and TDCS. And there's a wide range of studies that have looked at what happens when you deliver current to frontal lobes versus parietal lobes or other regions and compare those to a control condition or a sham placebo control condition Mm -hmm. to evaluate how these different brain systems, when modulated, uh, alter working memory performance. And so that's a basic science type approach. In the more clinically oriented space, there are ongoing studies like the one that we're doing now, the the phase three augmenting cognitive training in older adults trial funded by the National Institute on Aging, where we're leveraging that basic science information and taking it one step further. And in that context, what we're doing is pairing cognitive training. A lot of people know this as brain games, if you will. Uh, The first thing I'll say is that not all brain games are created equally. Some have been shown very effective over the last 20 years. Others have not. Well, taking what we've seen in the literature that has been beneficial in that domain, we're investigating this idea that if we take something like cognitive training, which is goal, its, its goal is in older adults, is to enhance cognition, and we apply a technique that can potentially facilitate the neuroplastic response of tissue learning at the neural level, by putting these two together, can we further enhance the cognitive gains or the cognitive recovery of function in our older adults, either without uh, dementia or mild cognitive impairment or with dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Hmm. And so those are some of the techniques right now that are being investigated fairly thoroughly to evaluate whether or not techniques like TDCS or other electrical current stimulation approaches can be used either adjunctively or alone to enhance cognitive function and have a clinical impact. So that's so interesting because I know that the um, trial and some of the other trials you have going on are focused on remediating age-related cognitive decline or altering mm-hmm. the trajectory of the decline that leads to dementia and just maybe general age-related conditions. What are you seeing so far? I mean, what are the kind of early results um, or what have you seen in the past um, that you could speak to? Well, so with the phase three trial, we're not allowed to see any of the data really in terms of unblinding of the conditions until the very end of the trial. So we don't know as of yet whether it will work or not. We have about another year and a half of data collection before this five-year trial uh, has completed all measurements of participants. At that point, we will know what the results of the trial are. That said, we've also ran a series of pilot trials that led up to the larger trial, as well as finished some smaller dose response trials recently that were really angling at not only looking at the cognitive enhancement component, but also looking using uh, multimodal neuroimaging to evaluate what are the mechanisms of change that underlie the cognitive improvements that we see with brain stimulation. And so in those recent studies, uh, what we have found is that with cognitive training paired with TDCS versus cognitive training paired with a sham placebo control condition, those that receive stimulation um, plus cognitive training actually have improvements on untrained tasks in working memory, which is one of the major domains that we're training. But better yet, what we're also seeing is that the functional networks within the brain, as measured by uh, blood oxygen level dependent functional magnetic resonance imaging, we can actually see specific increases in the communication within that network or functional connectivity uh, within the working memory network that relates to the behavioral gains that we're seeing with cognitive training and stimulation. Mm, So you're starting to see that. And and are these very significant or are they just sort of minor improvements? And I suppose it depends on who's, who's defining things, right? Right. We try to use an objective metric in terms of effect size to think about this when we're evaluating, especially pilot data. And so those things that have very small effect sizes are very unlikely to translate to having clinically meaningful impacts in larger trials. But those things that have moderate to large effect sizes are those that we consider to have potential promise for clinical translation. And in fact, a large part of the work that we do in my lab is not just brain stimulation, but it's also evaluating a wide variety of non-invasive methods to evaluate them for potential translation 
into clinical trials for potential impact on things like cognition, things like chronic pain or depression or a variety of different applications. Sometimes those are brain stimulation. Sometimes they're very different approaches. In this context, what we're seeing in our early data are actually large effect sizes in terms of brain connectivity changes, as well as large, but not as large as connectivity, uh, effect sizes on behavioral gains on untrained working memory. Now, we'll have to see if that holds true for a population-level study like the Phase 3 ACT trial. And that's our hope, because there's always that chance in science where you run a sample of 30 people, and oh, look, this looks great, there's a big effect size. But the true test is in these large, rigorous, blinded trials, and ultimately, at the end of the day, evaluating whether for a large representative sample of people, you can get these same effects and get them consistently. So that's a, uh, a, we'll be excited to see whenever it's going to come out in a year and a half, two years. I'm sure the data will take a while to analyze. I'm sure there'll be multiple papers that come out over the over the next several years. But that, so that'll be exciting. And we'll, we'll be sort of waiting with bated breath for that. But you mentioned a concept before um, when you mentioned uh, functional MRIs, fMRIs, um, in terms of memory networks and sort of this idea of hubs and networks. Can you just explain a little bit about what you mean by a memory network. You know, I think a lot of people are sort of used to thinking about the left part of the brain does this, the front part of the brain does this, the cerebellum does this. How does the the network concept as it emerges, how, how does that differ from that sort of traditional phrenologic thinking? Right. I think that's a, a wonderful question. As you said, the traditional thinking had been, oh, left brain, right brain. And then it evolved to front of the brain, back of the brain, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, what have you. What we found and, and what many people have found, not just us, but, but the field at large over the last 20 years or so with the evolution of functional magnetic resonance imaging, is that this localization approach of this single brain region does this single thing, or this single brain region does these three specific things, is really far too simplistic of a story. Because in reality, the brain is a hyper-connected network. There's lots of brain regions that do lots of things, and they contribute to a variety of processes. And so, for example, in working memory, there's been excellent work to really try to identify what we think of as the functional network for working memory performance. And what that means is this wide variety of 15 to 20 brain regions that consistently play a role in working memory performance. Now, on the one hand, you can think of fMRI in the classic sense or the older sense of, of differences in activation of the brain, right? So we see all these pretty pictures with these false color images, and it's the brain was activated here, the brain wasn't activated there. And that's still excellent data, and, and but still correlational in nature. But nonetheless, it means that these brain regions are correlated with this behavior. But by taking it a step further, you can start to look at how those different brain regions that are involved actually communicate with one another. And that communication happens across this network of related regions because no one region by itself creates cognition. It's these different regions communicating together that create this cognitive process. And by looking at how they communicate to one another, using something like functional connectivity, which really at its base is saying, all right, this one part of the network responded, it activated. But in time, do we see a temporal correlation where this other brain region also responds in sync with these other brain regions that are related? By quantifying that correlation in time, you can actually get a measure of their functional communication with one another. Sometimes we'll see whole networks that change as a relation to, let's say, age or to a certain disease state. In others, we might see very specific nodes. And nodes is a term meaning this brain region in the network versus this brain region in the network. Yeah. We might see a specific change in the communication between those nodes. But really with the evolution of our understanding of the brain, which will continue to evolve, and I'm sure 20 years from now we'll look at networks as a simplistic framework uh, as we look back at localizationism. And I, I'm excited about it for, for that day. But for now, we're really in this network-based model approach uh, with the idea that these brain regions together create these cognitive functions. So a follow-up question on that then is, do we see with, for instance, something like a short-term memory problem or uh, Alzheimer's, uh, do we see similar patterns of a broken network 
Are they networks that are out of whack that theoretically can then be restored or schizophrenia or depression? Are there, is there sort of a common signature or a common look at a broken network as it were, or is it not like that? Well, it's actually incredibly complex. It's, it's one theoretical approach to it, the idea that the network is broken. What the reality in some ways looks like is that, you know, in a, a class of disease, for example, like Alzheimer's disease, you may see a more common pattern where, for example, what's called the default mode or resting state network. This is the brain areas that are activated when you're doing nothing while you're laying quietly in the scanner, perhaps staring at a crosshair on a screen. And it's a very commonly activated pattern that we see when people are at rest. Well, this is significantly altered in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Now, the source of that alteration isn't entirely clear because it seems to be a multifactorial problem. We know that there's sclerosis in the hippocampus. We know that there's degradation in a wide variety of brain regions. There may also be interactions with beta amyloid deposits, interactions with tau deposits, but each individual patient will have a slightly different overall combination of these factors. And yet we do see on a group level a very common decline in default mode network connectivity. So In that, the fact that there are different sources that are contributing to this similar pattern means that it's very unlikely that there's a single one-shot catch-all magic bullet that, quote-unquote, fixes the network. However, if we get better at identifying what is underlying these alterations, we could potentially target those specific elements to enhance the overall communication of those networks. And that's really one of the ideas that we're trying to pursue with non-invasive brain stimulation, with the idea that if we can enhance the communication within these networks by either facilitating nodes that are deficient, right, or overall facilitating the connectivity of the network as a whole, that we might be able to basically provide training wheels, if you will, for this network to improve to a more functional state. So almost to come back online or to come partially back online, as it were. Right. You're giving the brain enough modulatory energy. Uh, it's almost, it sounds like a bit like physical therapy. I and mean, I've heard that analogy before. Sure. I think it's a great analogy. The idea is you're ch- attempting to, in the case of physical therapy, retrain the muscle or the limb or what have you. In this case, we're trying to retrain the brain. Hmm. You mentioned some of the papers from you know, decades ago. How long have you been into this technology? How long has this technology been around and how is it how has it changed in the last five years? Sure. I think the, the current iteration of transcranial electrical stimulation really came about in this new iteration in 2000 with a seminal paper by Michael Nietzsche and Walter Paulus, which was followed by a series of papers and eventually a, a paper in a clinical population by Felipe Fregna in 2005. And then the field started to expand exponentially. Um, now, The concept of applying electrical current to the head for medical uses has been around for hundreds upon hundreds of years. There's an old quote, and I can't remember the exact date of this, uh, 1800s or perhaps even before, of placing electric eels on the head for medical usage. Luckily, the technology has evolved quite a bit since that (laughs) period, and the concept of using electrical current to alter neuron performance is really not new. There's great papers in animal models in the 1950s from Ben Men and others in the 60s that, that demonstrate these basic principles of applying weak electrical current and changing the firing rates of neurons. But it wasn't until 2000 with this paper by Nietzsche and Paulus that the field really came into the modern era. And then it was actually a very quiet field for about five to almost 10 years. Over a five-year period, very few citations, very few groups, some initially starting to work. Fregney's paper comes out, and all of a sudden people start thinking about this as a potential clinical tool. And I came into this field around 2010. So I've been working in this area for about nine years. And we were just starting out using this tool as a basic science tool. We wanted to look at brain behavior relationship when we stimulated one brain region versus another coarse brain region. And over this last nine-year period, that work has really evolved from these basic science studies to these large clinical trials, attempting to apply this for meaningful impact on different either healthy older adults or patient populations. In the context of healthy older adults, really taking a preventative medicine approach to a 
attempting to enhance function before significant clinically relevant decline. But in other contexts, we're using this in chronic pain populations, uh, as well as attempting to get some early trials off the ground in, in the field of depression. And there are many people around the world doing these different types of clinically relevant research now. So there's been exponential growth within the field in the last five years alone. But I would say the field has grown in the last 10 years in leaps and bounds. In the last five years, the number of papers that you see published each year has increased at really an exponential rate that I don't think that any of us really anticipate. Yeah, I know. I certainly started hearing about it uh, four or five years ago. And that's why I was asking about I just, all of a sudden, it was like, okay, this seems to be like a real thing. And a lot of groups are interested in it. And it's so interesting. So are these protocols, and I think maybe I am hesitant to even use the word protocol. When you go and say, hey, we want to look at the demented brain or the aging brain, the, the, the brain that's slowing down. We want to look at age-related cognitive decline. And you have to design a study. And of course, the study has to be all designed ahead of time, you know, prospectively. And um, you can't change on the fly, as it were, uh, for the most part. How do you make the determination? In other words, when you're going through, just so I'm trying to maybe shed some light on your process or the process of a cognitive neuroscientist when they're thinking about, okay, I want to design a trial for age-related cognitive decline. How do you decide what the, the protocols might be? In other words, you have to place electrode leads on different parts of the head, uh, and you have to stimulate certain parts of uh, the brain, and as we've been talking about. What is your process for sort of determining that? If you, and, and I'm sure it's extensive and more time that you know would take longer than we have time for. But if you, I mean, even if you could simplify it to some level to sort of shed some light on how the research and the thinking is uh, is conducted, that would be interesting, I think, to us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it all starts with what's your question, right? So your central question is your starting place. So, for example, it is okay. I want to modulate some component of cognition in older adults? Well, first you have to ask yourself, what's that component of cognition? And that's going to take you further back in the literature to look at, okay, what are the neural correlates of this element of cognition? Okay, what are the neural correlates of, of where this is declining in function? For us, my lab is focused very much on working memory, speed of processing, executive function, and attention. And in older adults, what you know, 50 plus years of literature has demonstrated is that the frontal lobes decline faster than any other area in the aging brain, and that each of these elements of cognition are significantly impacted by that decline. So that tells us that in this context, we want to go for frontal lobes, at which point you have to say, well, okay, where in the world do I put these electrode leads or these electrodes to target these regions of interest? And that's going to take you back to the literature as well. Part of that may be going back and looking at what other people have done and looking at their results and their effect sizes and trying to determine what might be the best montage. But then there's other methods, methods that have now become more and more accessible that will actually allow you to take an MRI and run computational models that actually predict where current flow will go in the brain based on this location selection. Um, there's actually software that's been made freely available now that I think runs on top of MATLAB called Roast. And that software will allow you in a fairly simple fashion to go in and actually calculate these models and say, all right, if I know the frontal lobes are really my target, or I know that left frontal regions are really my target, you can then test in this computational software where you might best put your electrodes to target those specific brain regions. In the context where maybe some of these neural correlates aren't as well known, that's again where we go back to the literature and look and say, all right, in pilot trials out there, is there something that's shown potential efficacy? And if not, that means we have to go to the drawing board and say, all right, what do we know about this system? Where could we potentially apply these? And then we're going to run pilot studies to evaluate, okay, if we've chosen these electrode locations, these stimulation parameters, can we generate change in this system of interest based on our early pilot studies? And so, you know, in many cases with such a robust literature now, there's something about just about everything in the literature somewhere that you can at least build upon. And so the literature serves as a key element, but the real starting place is 
your central question. If you know what your central question is, you can leverage information about neural mechanisms or neural correlates of that function, and it can start to give you an idea of where to take or where to place these electrodes based on computational models or others that have done these techniques effectively in the literature as a starting place. But then it starts to get more complex where you have other parameter selections. Well, how much current do I pass? How long do I pass current? And a variety of other questions that actually matter quite a bit regarding what your actual effects on the brain tissue will be. Luckily, there are a lot of papers in the literature now. We've published technical guides on TDCS. Others have published really nice papers on parameter effects on tissue excitability. We actually recently published a textbook that actually covers all of this information for those starting through TDCS. But even outside of that, in the literature, you can find the information necessary. Or very commonly, what happens is I get an email or others in the field get an email saying, hey, I'm new this to TDCS, I'm new to this area, and I'm thinking about doing this. What's your advice? Um, and in fact, I spent uh, about an hour this morning responding to emails of that nature, just giving advice on and pointing people to references and papers uh, that can inform them better. But the literature is going to be an important resource, but really knowing the brain, knowing the question, um, these are important factors uh, that we always consider. And so we treat it um, as we would any science-based question. We break it down, evaluate it, and then ultimately, if we need more information, we run a pilot study. Yeah, amazing. So you mentioned the trial that you're doing now includes brain games. And you said there's brain games that have more data for them and some that do not. Do you, do you have a favorite brain game or cognitive task that you um, <laughs> train that you like? I mean, what we've typically done in this space is is really, again, go to the literature and you'll find that there are certain techniques that have 20, 30 years of literature behind them. One great example is the useful field of view training, which was done in what was called the active trial, where they ran almost 3,000 individuals through cognitive training of, I think, four different varieties. Uh, and this proved to be the most effective training of those applied, with effects lasting up to 10 years, and in fact, impacting the rate of MCI conversion in these healthy older adults. So we look for signatures like that. And then we evaluate, okay, where are these games now? What are the current providers of these games? How do we go out and get these games to use them for a research context? But then you'll have those where you go out and you see them and they look pretty and beautiful. And yet you cannot find any science backing them yeah. independently whatsoever. And that's where we start to throw up caution flags. And so what we did before this ACT trial is actually go out and pilot a wide variety of, of brain games to evaluate which we would choose to use in the, uh, the ultimate trial that we submitted and had funded. And I think, I mean, I have another sort of follow-up question for that. I mean, there's, as you probably know, I'm no doubt are aware, there's sort of an international push for multi-domain therapeutics in Alzheimer's. So not just doing one thing, but doing several things. So combining cognitive training with exercise, et cetera, perhaps taking some fish oil or omega-3s. Do you see this? And I don't know if you're in a position to comment on this, but do you or any colleagues that you know know that it, when people are eating right, they're controlling their blood sugar, they're correcting sleep apnea so they have enough oxygen, they're exercising or whatever, whatever it is that they're doing sort of try to approach health, do you see any differences in the, or would you posit differences in the effects that um, some of these things like TACS, TDCS, the transcranial electric stimulation tools that you guys are studying, would it make sense or have you seen anecdotally that there is an augmented response, meaning there's a better response for the people that are doing some of these other things at the same time as receiving these treatments? So one of the goals in our trials is actually to evaluate exactly that type of data. We're collecting an incredible amount of data on, you know, health history, personal history, family history, activities that they perform on a regular basis, um, whether it's exercise or otherwise. And, and we're one of the goals at the end of this trial is actually to look at exactly the question of which of these factors better predict in combination 
overall response to intervention. So we don't know the answer to that yet because that data really does take a large data set to evaluate because each mm-hmm. individual person is their own fingerprint, if you will. They've each got their own level of this activity. And yes, each person may exercise, but the amount they exercise, the type of exercise they do can be wildly different. The difference in a person who just walks slowly on a treadmill versus someone who does moderate to higher intensity exercise, the cardiovascular benefits are drastically different. And we expect those same kinds of impacts and the idea that the quality of these life factors may in fact have an impact. So we have an expectation they will. It's not entirely clear which of these factors will be related. That analysis will really be exploratory and data-driven in nature, but we hope to have some of those answers. But we, I, you know, I do, I do like the idea that has come out in this international push that we really need to, to attack not just Alzheimer's, but many different diseases uh, relating to the brain from these multi, with these multifaceted approaches. Because what's underlying these diseases is quite complex, and there's multiple factors that lead to this disease, not just one. You look at the beta amyloid hypothesis, which for years was thought to be the single hypothesis that explained Alzheimer's disease. And some people still prescribe to that, but what the data are suggesting is that this is one factor and not the single driving factor. And in fact, it probably isn't too surprising that every time we look for a magic bullet that explains everything, we fail to find it because human health and and human physiology are complex. In that same token, it shouldn't be too surprising that we have to take this multifaceted approach that's going to attack different domains of health to ultimately have both the best preventative approach, but also to have our best impact when there's active symptoms present in a disease state. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And just to, I kind of to bring this full circle a little bit, where do you, I mean, do you have any sense, you and colleagues, when you sit around for a glass of wine or something, you guys are just kicking it. Where do you see this field of non-invasive brain stimulation in the next five, seven years? I mean, how do you think it's going to evolve? I mean, you, you and probably some others, but um, you're probably doing some of the most important work with this big phase three clinical trial. How do you think it's going to shake out? You know, just what are you seeing in the next five, seven years, crystal ball? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great question. It's a question, I think, at conferences. Um, after the conference with Donna, we're all sitting around having a glass of wine. That is probably the most common conversation. And I think there's a lot of unknowns. Um, the field, if we, if we look at it in other terms, the, the field of transcranial magnetic stimulation took 20 plus years more to reach a point where it was FDA approved for the treatment of any type of disease or disorder. Um, So in this case, depression. And so one potential model is that TDCS goes that same route, hopefully not over as long of a period of time from the current date, uh, and eventually receives some form of approval as a a, a technique for treating a disease state or condition. Uh, And that's that's one option, at which point it becomes uh, something that's medically regulated and otherwise. Um, And that's probably the more classic pathway for technology of this sort. But it's also in this non-invasive space where the safety profile is is really kind of, of exciting and surprising in many cases. And we see very often um, that there are companies that will sell these devices to the public, what have you, and in the public domain. And so it, it adds a lot of these question marks as to, well, is this going to be something where you can go into a CVS or a Rite Aid or what have you, a Walgreens, and buy this off the shelf? In my crystal ball, I do not think that is the direction that this field is going. I think it's probably more likely that we'll see it follow a more similar path to TMS with the eventual FDA uh, approval for treatment of a disorder, at which point it opens the, the doors because one of the greatest limiters to non-invasive brain stimulation as a treatment technique like TMS is really whether insurances are able or willing to pay for that treatment. And for the longest time, people could receive TMS treatment at their physician's discretion, uh, but they had to pay out of pocket. That is currently where TDCS is as a field for the clinicians that are using it uh, around the country. Uh, and once an FDA approval is made, that opens the doors to potentially uh, pursuing Medicare, Medicaid approval for coverage, at which point if that happens over the next five to 10 years, this becomes a mainline treatment of sorts or mainline treatment option that is in the tool belt of clinicians that they can provide to their patients uh, without it requiring an out-of-pocket expense for every single session. Wow. That'll be the day that will be, we are waiting excitedly for that day. 
Dr. Woods, thank you so much for your time, um, for your leadership in this. This has uh, been extremely enlightening, um, and I hope uh, at some point to have you back to talk about uh, results. That would be great. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And, you know, I think that uh, the work you're doing uh, and uh, this podcast in particular, I think, provides an important voice um, to both the clinical community, but also the population at large for this kind of information. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So that's our episode. I hope it was useful to you. Check out the show notes on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comments section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. If you have questions or comments, connect with us on social media. Finally, to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N patreon.com forward slash evolving past. Thanks. I'll talk to you next time.